welcome everyone. Um, as John said, I'm the founder of the Wooden Group. We are a wealth management financial services marketing firm. I started uh, over 10 years ago around three pillars that I saw, wealth, next gen, and technology. And as you might imagine, people were not really that interested 10 years ago. So thankfully, uh, we've come a long way, baby. And Robin was kind enough to join us here in uh, Copenhagen. Yeah, I was really excited to be part here. Why? Because I'm a recovering insurance sales agent. I'm not exactly um, I'm so active in the world, uh, this space. Nevertheless, um, I've also worked for an uh, industrial family in Germany, so I know a little bit um, that. Um, and what we actually did um, a few two years ago, I started a blog, Five Euro Jindo homepage, which exploded into a content platform for the finance and insurance industry. Um, and uh, yeah, we have ten thousands of um, followers around the world. And um, what also happened, I was always on stage. Actually, I was really angry at the industry, insurance and finance, and I went on stage and talked about the elephants in the room, and I didn't get booed out, actually, but actually uh, got calls, and uh, insurers and banks, uh, we helped with the building digital products and services, scouting startups and trends, and also with a modern way of uh, attention hacking, and that's what we do. Uh, and um, we're here today in Copenhagen with you, Afro. So the last thing I'm going to say about myself that uh, is not from a braggadocio standpoint, but um, recently I was named the number one influencer online for wealth management. And the reason why I think that's interesting is because I think it signals a trend, really. Uh, in addition to sort of being my Kardashian moment, which, uh, okay, maybe, uh, what it really means is that people are really paying attention to digital and wealth management and it's really here to stay. So uh, let's begin, Robin. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, we were talking about wealth management and the current discussions. Um, what do you see, how do you see, um, did the customer change um, over the last uh, years and um, do you see different customer segments with different customer behavior? What's your take on that? So that's a great question. I mean, obviously this track is all about next gen. And, um, you know, sometimes I say I might have been the first person to say millennial, but for sure I will not be the last. I think what millennials have done is really changed sort of the way we buy and sell wealth management products. Uh, but it's certainly not limited to millennials. I think the way that they have approached things, the transparency, authenticity, and sort of their demands for something beyond investment advice has really changed a lot of uh, what we need to pay attention to. Uh, the other important segment is women. Uh, women who obviously influence their millennial children. Well, I might influence my children to some extent, but not to the extent I'd still like to. Um, really drive a lot of the decisions and investment decisions. So I would say... Um, do they act differently, what do you think? They totally do, because... Um, so uh, if you were here for day one, you saw everything that was going on with ESG and uh, purpose and sustainable and impact investing. And that has become sort of a calling uh, cry for many women and millennials and then impacting the way the entire industry behaves. So it's not really about investment advice anymore. It's not just about returns. It's more about holistic advice and financial planning. Yeah. And so uh, the other thing I would say about that, just to circle back to the question you asked about generations is that um, particularly from marketing and positioning and messaging standpoint uh, I think the takeaway here should be that there's not a one-size-fits-all but you don't want to over segment so in other yeah. words firms and funds that come out with here's our product for Millennials or our product for women are really missing the boat yeah, yeah. And what I think and when we talk about different segments in the customer base is um, let's not talk only about the millennials. I think that's a very important point and a little bit like the shocker because it's really new. I think we should also talk about the situation in private uh, private banking. For example, you have the park patriarch who is 80, 90 years old and then you have the youngster who is in the 60 or 70s and what a lot of private banks in my opinion do, uh, do wrong is that they focus on the patriarch and then when the patriarch uh, has uh, dies and uh, money is handed over or certain you know regulatory things 
take place, then the younger person, the 60, 70 year old person, uh, already has his bank for 40, 50 years himself. So I think the people who do not see uh, also in the private banking, not only in the wealth management, but also in the private banking sector, not the whole family, uh, they are also missing the boat. And I think that a lot of private bankers uh, are doing a bad job actually. I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, when you think about holistic products, holistic advice, you need to think about families and multi-generational marketing uh, and different communication messages for different family members and how to really appeal. Uh, one of the numbers I saw around 10 years ago that was really shocking was that 98% of wealth holders changed advisors. Uh, okay. And where you might dispute, uh, recently I saw 73%, we might dispute what the actual number is. The truth is that we should really pay attention to the trend. Yeah. So I don't know about your children. I know your daughter's a little bit younger than mine, but our kids are not really listening to what it is that we want to do, and nor should they. Yeah. Uh, they should be finding their own um, way in the world, and the way that they that you reach them and the messages that you give to them will really form their idea of your brand. I think uh, the problem is for next geners, if we just use that as an umbrella term, uh, they still remember 2008, they still remember how their parents have been impacted by 2008, yeah. and they don't want to have it happen to them again. They don't want to have... Uh, do, you, do you really think they have this, this knowledge and the, the conscience about 2008? Aren't they, they, haven't they seen 10 years, 11 years of hyper growth and everything is going to be fine and then... And um, have they been spoiled by the super boom we are seeing right now? That's a great question, Roman. I don't know what you think or what's happening in Europe, but I would say in the U.S. it's still sort of a crisis that people understand. They've seen their parents' retirement savings in some cases really be decimated. Yeah. They need to continue to work. Uh, they've seen the economy, uh, yes, of late it's improving. But definitely uh, the market and um, the effects are still being, being felt from 2008. Shake up in the job, shake up in the job market uh, and financial services. So I think we're still feeling the residual impact of that. And uh, we're still struggling with the ability to be more transparent and authentic, both in terms of communications and in terms of products. Uh, I think the idea of derivatives, wrap products, structured products, and things are not flying like they used to, um, but people are more interested in doing well, doing good, uh, sustainable investing and impact investing. Well, um, I think um, there we have different generations. We have the baby boomers, I think, who still remember different crises and situations, even like long-term things, like uh, super crises uh, of their parents' generation and the stories of that. Um, I have been in, in the Gen Y also, they remember the 80s and the beginning of the 90s was different of finding jobs and internships and like that. But I have the impression that uh, the millennials um, have not seen real crisis, at least over here. Um, and the, the effect of 2008 was not so dramatic over here as it has been in the US. We didn't have this foreclosure thing, for example. Yeah. And there were some losses and some difficulties in the economy, but not, it was not such a bloodbath, I think. Um, what I find quite interesting is that we see in the uh, millennial generation two moves, two trends, I personally believe. You have this one Instagramization of life, in which people um, choose their vacation destiny of the self equality of the hotel and beach where they're going to, um, and not caring about future and just about con consuming. Um, on, and on the other hand, you have this trend for financial fitness. You have a lot of people thinking about how to create wealth, about how to um, manage wealth when they have wealth, but also how to create wealth. You have a whole movement about entrepreneurship. So I think this generation is torn between two extremes. Um, when we talk about wealth creation and wealth generation, um, what do you see and think has changed there over the years? So that's a great question. There's a lot packed in there. Let's sort of unpack that. Um, so millennials, and, and by the way, all of these things are really just trending information, certainly not limited to millennials because I think it has wider application. Yeah. I think they've really changed us to more of a millennial mindset uh, and thinking more like them. So millennials today and more people really are more about experience, experiences versus things. Uh, previous to this, people wanted to accumulate things. And people now, even though there is Instagramification, which I just pronounced, which I can't believe, uh, Insta Instagramification has certainly created sort of a FOMO, which is the fear of missing out, 
among many, and social media has uh, an effect which I think is yet to be sort of um, felt, because uh, we don't really have data points on that. But um, for example, what it's done is to really force financial services institutions into that client experience being more important for next gen yeah. and for others rather than just the products or the investment return. The client experience, getting expensive tea out of a $500 Chinese cup uh, in your private banking appointment, is that a customer experience people still want today? No. Go away, the mahogany tables, the leather chairs, all of the sort of trappings of uh, wealth. Yeah. Because today's new young and wealthy want something completely different. You asked about entrepreneurship. Something like 70% of next gen will try entrepreneurship. So they're creating wealth in more and different ways, and they're paving their own way. And that means that you cannot, again, have the one size fits all. So digital also means something different to many different people. So we tend to think, and our next panel will talk a little bit about uh, digital advice. But digital can be so many different things. Digital can be client experience, client communication, can be around product. And it's certainly not limited to next geners. Um, if you check the Capgemini World Wealth Report, you'll see that the appetite is very high among baby boomers for a digital experience. Yeah, and, and so, I, I yeah. couldn't agree more. Uh, why? Because uh, we also talk regularly to um, affluence in the bracket from three, four, five to 30 million. And what we see there is um, that there's a totally disalignment between what private banking and wealth management thinks, and what, how these customer things, and the customer group themselves. Uh, average person in their 50s just in, inherited or received or made a little bit of something. But let's take the classical case of the person who inherited the money uh, or through marriage or whatever. Um, we sit down and what I ask him is, um, and how, how, how do you inform yourself? And he says, okay, um, I, I don't read white papers, I just look through the internet with everybody else, maybe with the different uh, topics in mind. And I say, um, and then he goes shopping. He goes shopping through different private banks and wealth management and financial institutions, financial advisors, and he actually wants uh, and compares. Yes. And he doesn't want, uh, and when he said, well, if I could choose, I would love to have concepts, solutions for my financial, let's not call it problem, but you know, challenge and strategy. Yeah. And he wants to compare it and have the best. And I said, and how about the personal touch the private bankers talking always about uh, that, that you guys love? And he said, I don't care about the personal touch. I want a solution to my problem. I actually would prefer not going to five different banks uh, and having done five afternoon meetings, but just uh, having it quicker, maybe also in a digital way. And this guy was not a millennial. This guy was not a Gen yeah. Y, Gen X. This person was, uh, I think, in, the, in their 50s. So I believe that uh, private bankers are missing, um, uh, are, are, are not getting the, the change in a lot of cases here. Um, 100%. I just yeah. want to weigh in on that a little bit, Robin. Uh, 100%. I mean, it's interesting to find that digital is really nascent to private banking and private wealth. Yeah. Uh, but as I was saying to someone yesterday, uh, that's where the money is. Uh, so when you think about digital and you think about your offerings, particularly for private banks and people serving a lot of segments, ultra high net worth and high net worth is really the most underserved market for digital, yeah. uh, but yet has the most return. And I couldn't I mean, agree more that it's it's really the older generation that's looking for it. Uh, so for some of us that are not ultra high net worth and high net worth, we might not think money is a problem, but there's so many complexities with having different banks, different managers, being a global mobile family, having different family members. So the real solution to all of that is digital offering. And so banks are missing out by not having these digital offerings. And communicating that. And not only that, it's a service to replace the 100, 150,000 fee for just getting an overview about your assets per year, but maybe if you have the overview about all assets of your high net worth family or individual, you can also provide uh, other services and uh, products to this uh, person and family and to provide really solutions. It's, un it's actually really interesting that uh, a lot of people cannot say uh, what is my value or the worth um, uh, of my assets uh, in real time but they need to call and a lot of papers are being shoveled and 27 different uh, bankings are locked in actually there needs to be one control panel for your wealth um, and I know in Europe there are a lot of uh, companies working on it not a lot but there are some companies working on this in different angles but uh, it's actually unbelievable that this doesn't exist to answer today but what it about, does yeah. exist. I just want to talk yeah. about that a little bit because you uncovered something really important there. 
there are certain complexities with wealth that people don't really appreciate, and reporting standards are now being created yep. with data flows into platforms so that wealthy families can see their holdings. Portfolios are now create have now made up of not so much on equities, probably 50% on equities, and 50% alternative assets. So that becomes difficult to report on, yep. and that is a huge opportunity. There are many companies in the U.S. working on that and delivered to market. But uh, again, that is uh, a really new area, so people can uncover. Um, the other thing that uh, they can uncover where their wealth is, do they have an over-concentrated stock position in something because they have more than one advisor that they're working with? That can sometimes happen. Do they have cash sitting in a bank that they didn't even realize because they could have multiple bank accounts across uh, multiple institutions? So. Or did value change of certain assets? I mean, uh, in one of the talks we had with um, uh, high net worth individuals uh, or affluent, uh, he said, you know, I was really wasting money on this car and uh, it was just uh, insured for 20,000 and now it's worth 200,000. He didn't notice I was buying groceries. This is all Porsche. Yeah. And uh, or I bought a, an, 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 a home somewhere, and, and it went up in price a lot. And I think real-time information about the assets uh, delivers you the possibility to make wise decisions about your wealth, and to secure, and to manage it, and to uh, keep it. Another thing I would like to yes. talk about is wealth creation. Um, I strongly believe that wealth creation has changed um, in, in the last 10, 20 years. But maybe what's your take on it and your experience, especially from the US? Uh, totally, wealth, is, wealth creation has changed. So you find, uh, as I said, something like 70% of people are now trying entrepreneurship and creating wealth. Uh, particularly in the US, you see markets like Silicon Valley with the new IPO millionaires. Uh, you know, it's created a lot of wealth in younger generations, and so that is a huge opportunity for wealth management firms and asset managers to create products to help capture really the interest of uh, this new generation of millionaires and multimillionaires. Uh, they will have their wealth for a long period of time, but they also are not very well educated on, uh, to go back to the point you were making before about financial fitness, financial literacy, financial education. They may have a concentrated stock position, which they need to figure out how to manage. Uh, they may have some other issues, so there are definitely opportunities with the wealth creators as well, and they also have particular expertise. So I think there's opportunities for platforms, digital platforms again, that help families co-invest or make direct deals or something to create more community because more and more high net worth, ultra high net worth people really want to create community. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And what I uh, would like to add is I think that uh, the industry is totally, not totally, I think the industry for large parts is missing out on this new way of changing uh, wealth and how to help wealth creation change. Why? In meetings, I um, always am asked the question, um, in first meetings about the known industrial families. They say, oh, do you know uh, the, the Rockefellers? Do you know yeah. the Vanderbilt? They say yes. I say, do you know Karina uh, Garcia? And they're looking, no. I think, I said, she makes millions on Instagram selling slime. Or um, do you know Kuruki? And they're looking like, if I'm mentally ill, I say, he makes millions um, uh, on, in online gaming as an esports professional. And I say, and I ask, is your organization ready and culturally ready, digital ready to serve this new um, segment um, of people that have a, a new wealth? And I think that there, the industry, at least in Europe, in my experience, um, is culturally not there. They like their golf clubs and their regattas and their um, fancy foods. I think uh, neither Karina Garcia or Kuroki has time and wants to go in a mahogany building or spend a waste time at a fancy lunch. And I think there needs to needs to be a radical change in um, and to prepare to serve these people because let's not talk about digital transformation and change always about the threat let's talk about opportunity i think the industry can serve a lot and another um, uh, uh, topic um, i would like to talk about is um, of course there's sophisticated instrument for high net worth individuals families and affluence but doesn't actually digital transformation democratize this these knowledge and instrument and tools that everybody who has a little bit of something um, could actually better manage their wealth and increase wealth. Isn't actually digital transformation uh, the, 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 the promise to, to a better world for um, all? 
of course, I mean, the access to information, well, let's break that down a little bit also. Just the access to information. So I often say people will vet you before they've met you. So we all know that wealth management is really a referral business and that uh, mainly, largely still, people will refer people into uh, their wealth manager, particularly for high net worth and ultra high net worth, although there is some reluctance where people don't want to really share their advisor with others because they think that um, that could take away the time and attention that they might be getting. But uh, obviously today, people have access to information through the internet. So even though you're given the name of an advisor and that may happen offline, people are still going to get online and start Googling. So in preparation to this trip to uh, Copenhagen, some people here uh, may have Googled some restaurants to see where they were going to eat, hotels, where they were going to stay, uh, and so on. And the very same thing is really happening in wealth management. So there is this lost opportunity that people don't know when they have an old website or something that looks like the mahogany website, or yeah. they have cliches like... Not responsive. Not responsive. We put clients in just first with a picture of a yacht. Some of these old images and old messages don't really appeal. So you might know who's coming through your net because they've um, reached you, but you may not know what the follow-up has really been, and that's really the big opportunity. What I uh, ask my clients a lot of times is, uh, and what they answer me when I say you need to do more in digital space, you need to think about what happens when the people Google you, when they look for you on social media, this new thing that's 15 years, has been around for 15 years. So they really, there are financial institutions with, um, managing billions of euros and dollars that are not on social media and mainstream technology. Um, and I think this is an, uh, an urgent situation that needs to change and they are missing out on a lot of revenue there. Um, One thing I yeah. want to say about that, so some of the brands, we're doing a survey right now on Twitter, which we'll be sharing the results from later, uh, to find out which firms are using social media and to what extent. Uh, so I would say the following, that many firms are on social media, Robin, but individuals are not using social media to the extent that they can build their personal brand. You are the number one wealth management influencer on this planet, yeah? Uh, what could you recommend a person out there sitting in the audience, uh, maybe having not this influence yet, what kind of tools and tactics could you recommend them? What could they do tomorrow or maybe next week to at least start? So a couple of things, I mean, particularly uh, in wealth management, it's really important to be authentic and to be transparent. So the more information you can put up on your LinkedIn profile or Twitter or whatever your company allows, if you're working under those uh, regulations and compliance, put up something that really is meaningful to you. Uh, and it's not really all about business. Um, so people want to really, in terms of holistic advice, they want to really work with a holistic person. So make sure that your profile includes professional information, but also personal information. Let's connect on that. So uh, if you're a person who enjoys travel, or you like a particular part of the country, or you like cooking, or whatever it is that appeals to you, uh, you have a passion for financial literacy, or uh, perhaps you like running, or um, let's say you work with um, uh, pediatric cancer, whatever that could be, these are all connection points that you can begin a conversation. So those are the touch points that people need to make sure that they have on their profile and thinking about more than that. I like to tell the story about uh, a client of mine that I worked with who um, was very interested in building out his personal brand and he worked in artificial intelligence and wealth management. And he thought that was a super cool, really exciting field and posted a lot of really technical stuff on LinkedIn which really did not get very much engagement. Last summer, as sort of a recreational gardener, he grew a bumper crop of cauliflower, and he found that he had tons of cauliflower that he didn't know what to do with, and casually I just suggested to him, have you ever heard of cauliflower rice, which is just simply grinding up cauliflower, a low-carb sort of favorite. Yeah. And so he made a post on LinkedIn about cauliflower rice. He had a bumper crop, he offered one recipe and asked people if they had another recipe. To his surprise, that post went viral. He had comments from the American Rice Council, <laughs> from uh, people who never ever interacted with him on any of his technical uh, posts, but it really showed a lot about him and they were all people from his network. It was just a conversation starter, uh, cauliflower rice. So cauliflower rice can be just as important as AI. 
Well, I think okay. nowadays people have, I call it a BS radar. People can smell and taste if somebody is not authentic online. Yes. And um, if you really share what you um, also share, not only your professional side, but also the stuff you're passionate about, uh, people are going to uh, engage with you if they have any connection. In our case, or my case is, um, 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 I'm a diehard Hamburg Sports Club fan. We have really 10 uh, hard years behind us. We're waiting for the first national title since 1988. We've been relegated to second league. It was really, really hard. And I say this in Germany, the whole audience is laughing uh, and most of the time, and I get a lot of pity. Uh, but you cannot believe how much uh, people are calling uh, us from, especially in the insurance industry, that say, I've been also a fan of Hamburg Sports Club for 30 years. and great that in bad times you say also something about it. It's unbelievable that these things work if you don't do it intentionally, if you really do it from straight from the yeah. heart. It doesn't mean you should share anything, should be, you know, you should think about, but in, in the end it's about giving your presentation. And the great thing about Authentic is it's easy. It's easy. Oh. You don't need to fake anything. You can be authentic all day. It's not exhausting like putting up a shahar. Right. So that's the really cool thing about being authentic, I think. Well, you've been a great example of that yourself. I mean, breaking down the insurance industry, for example, where people don't have a very good uh, image of the insurance industry. I mean, how many people here want to sort of take a shower once you hear about insurance? Uh, not so clean, right? Uh, but you've been able to shine a light on that and be more authentic and transparent, I think. Well, I would like to be, uh, now, I would like to disagree with you right now, but since I started my career in the sales and I was like the sales agent, the lowest hierarchy of the Allianz uh, sales Empire. Sales and insurance? Ugh. Yeah, you see. Um, but um, also for them, I think uh, it's important to give the sales agents and brokers who are still a very important sales um, uh, distribution channel to also give them these tools and instruments about new media um, and to teach them what to do. I think the worst thing you can do in social media uh, these days is try to sell something. Uh, if you say, oh, this is my product, buy me, call me, at some point you should mention that people can also do business with you, but you need to give, 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 give. I mean, uh, you do it too, you give a lot of knowledge, what you know about uh, wealth tech or wealth uh, management and the trends and all that you see around the world, um, you give to give away for free, um, uh, but it still um, uh, leads to a lot of um, 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 incoming uh, re requests and same as us. So I think you need to give, give, give a lot uh, and, and take that. You know, on that point, it's really interesting because I think there's a big divide between uh, wealth management and insurance, for example. Yeah. The insurance industry is all about sales, 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 sales. Wealth management is all about uh, manage, manage, manage. And I think we'll find ourselves somewhere in the middle because everyone finds themselves, regardless of what you are, selling something. Yeah, and I think that both worlds could maybe learn also from each other because on the one side, to have like a very structured uh, you need to sell so much uh, products in that time with that amount of points and money and what did you do today and have ranking lists like in some sports and shout people and use pressure which is still done today in the insurance industry no doubt about it we don't have any consulting in the insurance industry it's uh, in the private sector it's mostly about selling and putting products in the throat of people on the other hand I was uh, when I worked for a private bank I, I came from the insurance industry and asked and they were saying, oh, we could do better in sales. I say, okay, show me your rankings. What are your percentages? And they said, we don't have that. I was really surprised. So I think one, the insurance could work a little bit more with like doing something for the customer or meeting, not just to try to sell something. Yeah. On the other hand, I think the uh, private uh, banking sector, wealth management could learn from let's use targets, let's use a little bit of competition in order to, to, to um, achieve more together. Right, well, with the average age of financial advisor globally uh, somewhere in the late 50s, uh, and probably for insurance also, yeah. we really need to, just to sort of tie up our session here, we really need to work on the next geners and how to recruit them into the industry. And with most of the entry-level jobs being in sales, that's really difficult and a turn-off. So, if you made it to here, it means you really like the video. It would mean the world to me if you could hit the subscribe button down here or sign up for a newsletter so we can give you all the hottest newest trends we scout around the world for free even sooner.